you get it three fifteen, you might be two forty five, even better. Because if you get here before then, you might be late. Hey, I mean, you might not have a seat if you get here. I mean, I'm sorry, if you get here after then, you might not have a seat because I'm anticipating a full house on next Sunday. Uh, now I know it's not going to even be enough room to fit everybody in here, but we're gonna make, we're gonna squeeze everybody in here. We're gonna have a good time. Amen. Hey, Amen. I want you for a moment just to turn in your Bibles as we prepare to go into the Word on today. I want you to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 is where we're going to start today. Oh, wow. Brother Donald brought back us. Uh, that's, man, that picture, that picture is over three years old. That's when we, that's our very first service we had at Kennedy Elementary. Y'all see the music notes in the background and all that? That's a true elementary school cafeteria. Amen. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we want to read verses 1 through 5. Are you there? Amen. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. And it says here, it says, I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom. Preach the word of God. Be prepared, whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. For a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. They will follow their own desires and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. But you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. Now, I want you to turn over to Galatians chapter 6 real quickly. I'm coming from two passages today. So we first read, we first, uh, we first read from 2 Timothy. Now we're going to read from Galatians chapter 6. And I only want to read three verses there in Galatians 6. And I'm going to start at verse 6 where it says, Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Now, I want to talk from this, uh, on this subject today, how to appreciate your pastor. How to appreciate your pastor. Repeat after me. How, how? to pre appreciate, appreciate your pastor. Yeah. Amen. Pastor, it's so good to see you. That's our brother from across the street from St. James. Amen. Pastor is Binder, Pastor Aaron Binder, awesome man of God. Amen. We look forward to great fellowships with him. We're going to talk about how to appreciate your pastor. Now, let me go ahead and set this up and go ahead and help you all with something because I don't want you all to fall into the mindset or the mind frame that a uh, pastor is trying to manipulate or get anything out of you. Amen. I just want to just share some things in the word that will help us to understand how to have an appreciation for the man and woman of God who feed our souls. Amen. Because that's such an important. Uh, tax. So again, I know next Sunday is pastoral anniversary Sunday. You know, I know y'all got some plans, you know, some things planned for us. We thank you. We appreciate it. But this is not to get anything out of you. Amen. I just want to share with you what the word says. Now, let me go ahead and just kind of share some things with you from a personal uh, perspective before I go into the, the context of what uh, Paul is writing to Timothy. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I have to tell you 
I have to tell you, I'm thankful today because as I stand before you at 39 years of age, I've only had two pastors my entire lifetime. Only two. When I know some brothers who and preachers and pastors who've had about 40 pastors in two years, I've only had two pastors in almost 40 years. So I thank God for that. And God used these two men in a great way to bless my life and to make my spiritual walk in my ministry what it is today. But most recently, God used my pastors in the persons of Bishop Bill and Pastor Cheryl Hines, who we're going to hear from on next Sunday, to absolutely change my life. Now, when I first met them back in December 99, I only thought that it was just an interview. I was going in to try to get a minister of music job just to kind of keep some little stability and just to bless the people through music and worship ministry. But little did I know that between the year 2000 and 2014, I would have graduated from college, secured steady employment, got married, bought a home, accepted my calling into the ministry and had two children and then began to pastor a church. And I'm thankful because for the last 17 years, we have been under our, their leadership and although we've been gone for the last three years we still show love and appreciation toward them just like we did when we were there so it didn't stop in March of 2014 when I turned in my resignation and I began to plant the church it didn't stop then but it, it continues to go on because I tell people all the time they are still my pastors I love them I appreciate them and a lot of what I'm teaching you came straight from them so I'm thankful for that because I've had that opportunity to sit under them and that's why every fourth Sunday in April that afternoon don't ask me to do anything don't ask me to preach anywhere don't ask me to go to a musical don't ask me to go hang out with you because that is the Sunday we're going to be sitting in New Covenant Christian Church and we're going to be showing our pastors how much we appreciate them that's what we do that, that's just that's the order of God because I know personally my life would be messed up if it were not for the man and woman of God speaking into my life amen so I'm thankful for the the 14 years that that we served under their leadership and we and we don't just go just to sit Amen. We, we, we sow. We don't just sit. We sow into their lives. We sow personally and we sow from this church because they have been a blessing to us personally and they've also been a blessing to this church. As a matter of fact, a lot of the startup money that came to start this church came from them. Yeah. Amen. I, you know, I, I, I got to let them know. We didn't ask them for anything. We didn't ask them for anything. The, the bishop and the pastor call us in the office. They say, you know what, pastor? We know that God has called you to start this church. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to do our best to bless you. You are not going to walk out these doors with anything less than $5,000. That's, that, that's it. And you know, and, and guess what? When we left, we actually had a little bit more than that. Now come to say, you know, you know when you first started church, fast, you know, that's all gone within a matter of the first couple of months. Amen. Because the rent where we were meeting at the time was about $2,500 as it was. So that was half of that gone right there. And then, but I mean, but that's some other stuff I'm not going to get on. I'm not going to get into the rest of that. But what I want to do here is I want to look at this letter, first of all, that, that Paul wrote to young Timothy. We want to look at that because this is where the pastoral responsibility lies. See, what we got to remember is I have a responsibility to you all. If I serve as your pastor, I want you to know my responsibility to you. But then on the flip side of that, I want to share some things as far as your responsibility to me as your pastor. Amen? Now, now, look at this. The first one, I want to look at the purpose of the pastor. And we saw that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the first five verses. Because here in Paul's second letter to Timothy, the young pastor that Paul was spiritual father to, he shared several things that were needed for pastoral care. And there were five things that, that Paul charged young Timothy to do. First of all, and you'll see this on the screen, first of all, he charged young Timothy to preach the word. Yes, sir. Yeah. Preach the word. 
Simple. Somebody say, preach the word. Preach the word. See, the word of God is inspired by God. Amen. It is the very breath of God and the very heart of God and is the very mind of God. And it's also the instructions and the guide for daily living. And you'll see that in uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, in Titus chapter 1, verse 3, and Colossians chapter 1, verse 5. So you'll see that. So he charges young Timothy, first of all, preach the word. Yes, sir. That's your first responsibility to preach the word. My first responsibility to you all is to preach the word of God. Can you say amen? amen. That's my first responsibility. And watch that. Not only am I to preach the word, but watch this. The pastor is to also be ready and instant in and out of season. Yeah, yeah. I got to be ready and instant in and out of season. So outside of being prepared on a Sunday in a Bible study night, the pastor should always have a word, no matter when they call on you. Yeah. I have to always have a word because many times people that we lead, pastor, you know, they go through things. They they have say they go through losses and they go through things like just recently with this storm that's, that just happened. Uh, I talked to a pastor yesterday. Quite a few of his members lost everything they had. So that pastor has to be ready to give those people a word that is within that season. Yes, sir. Amen. That's not the time to be preaching about bring ye all the tithes. Amen. Because right now, hey, I, I, my, my employment is gone. My home is gone. I don't have anything left, Pastor. I need a word that's going to help me in this situation. And I guarantee you one thing. If you are a pastor or if you are a preacher, you better have a word. You got to have a word. There's no skating around it. You can't try to look up something. You can't try to copy somebody else's message. You can't try to um, go and look up somebody else's outline on Google. Yeah, you can pull some things from there, but you can't take the whole thing. You got to have a word in your spirit. I should be able to walk up to you and have a word for you in your situation and not even have my iPad, not even have my Bible. I should be able to speak a word into your life. So Paul says to Timothy, he says, be ready. Be instant in season and out of season. And see, I know I got some preachers in here and I don't know how your, 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 your pastors were with you when you first started pastoring, but I know my pastor expected all of his preachers to have a word. You know, and, you know we, on first Sunday nights, I never shall forget, on, there was one first Sunday, you know, he always would tell us, preachers, and I'm telling my I got two preachers in. Preachers always be ready. You're right. Because, you know, I, on first time I walk in there, you know, and I go and, you know, be ready to lead my praise and worship and do my, do my little minister of music thing or whatever. And then well, I'll never forget this first Sunday night, the bishop walked over to the organ. He said, Reverend, you preaching tonight. Yeah. That was the only notice I had. One time they were on vacation and um, he was, they, they didn't know whether they were going to be back on time or not, Pastor, but he, he sent a text to all the preachers. He said, preachers, I don't know who I'm going to call on, but whoever the Lord lead, y'all just be ready to preach. So everybody need to have something. When we went to ministers meeting, the ministers training, you had to have a 10-minute message ready. You didn't know whether they were going to call on you or not, but the bottom line is you better have a word in your mouth to bless the people and I will tell you this when we first started this church we didn't we didn't have a whole lot of money we didn't have any musicians we didn't have a building we didn't have uh, we didn't even have members but one thing we did have is we had a word from God and I stood on that word for the last three years you got to have a word. Somebody say, you got to have a word. Yeah. Amen. So, we, so he charges Timothy to preach the word. Then he charges him to be ready, instant, in and out of season. But watch this. He also charges young Timothy to convince. Somebody say, convince. Yes. Now, in the King James, it says reprove. In the NIV, it says correct. Now, this means to put a person under conviction, to lead a person to see his or her sin and feel guilty over it. God holds the pastor responsible for preaching against sin. Get this, whether the people want to hear it or not. Yes, sir. The truth is the truth. Yeah. God calls. 
because the pastor, you got to preach against sin whether they want to hear it or not. And get this, because no pastor is perfect. I'm not perfect. Pastor Menda is not perfect. But I tell you one thing, that whether we struggle with the sin or not, we still got to preach against it. We still got to say what the word of God says. And I tell y'all all the time, especially when I'm teaching on those hard subjects, I'm going to say, church, I'm going to tell you something. This cuts me before it even cuts you. See, if the word ain't cutting me, then that's a problem. So I got to come in here with my band-aids and, and all my little uh, ointments and everything on because I done got all chopped up before I even brought the word to you. So the Bible said, he says, here, we got to correct. We got to reprove. Amen. Amen. We got to preach against sin. And many preachers, many pastors don't like preaching against sin. I can't come in here every Sunday and tell you, oh, God's going to bless you. Jump up and turn around three times and get your blessing. Oh, I tell you, there's a miracle coming your way and it has your name on it. It has my name on it. I can't come in here hooping and hollering every single Sunday. Now, there will be some Sundays where hooping and hollering is in order, but that's not going to be every single Sunday because I know I got to give you a word that's going to correct you in your situation. Yes, sir. So we can't be afraid to stand before God's people and tell them the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Somebody say convince. convince. Amen. So he says, preach the word. He says, be ready. Be in, instant in and out of season. He says, convince. Now watch this. This is a tough one. He also says, rebuke. Uh-oh. Oh. Don't y'all tune out on Don't y'all tune uh -uh. I'm glad we got our shout in a little earlier because we might not shout right now. I'm glad we got our worship and our praise on earlier because we might not get it on right now. Because the Bible said, he said, we're to rebuke. Now, this is a very strong and sharp word and it's very difficult for many people to deal with because of pride and sometimes familiar familiarity with close friends and family nevertheless there are times when a person must be rebuked yes, there must be rebuked listen listen don't get mad with the pastor when he got to rebuke you. Don't get mad when the pastor got to tell you you're wrong. Amen. Because you have, you have to understand it's not about you and it's not about that pastor, but what it is about is the kingdom of God. Yes, sir. See, many times what we have a tendency to do in the church, we take rebuke from the pastor. We take it personally. Now, I've seen folk get rebuked on the job. I've seen folk get rebuked at home. I've seen folk get rebuked in all other situations, but yet they still keep going back to whatever situation they got rebuked in. Yeah. But pastor, something about when they get rebuked at the church. Uh, <laughs> It's something about when, when, when the pastor got to call you in and tell you about your sin or when the pastor got to sit you down for a season or whatever, then the first thing they want to do is get mad and leave the church. I don't go to church for all that. Who he think he is? I'm grown just like he is. I put my pants on one leg at a time just like he is. He a man just like me. Once again, you taking it personal. Oh my God. You're taking it personal. And guess what? There are times... Guess what? And a lot of times, you know how they, uh, when, uh, back in the day when they used to, when you used to whip the children, you tell them, it's going to hurt me as much as it hurts you. And you know, and sometimes now, when it comes to beating children, that's a different story. It, it don't hurt me more than hurt them, but I preached that a few weeks ago. Y'all go back and get to, um, y'all go back and listen to that later. But there are times when I don't feel comfortable having to rebuke people. It makes me uncomfortable, and I know it makes them uncomfortable, but it has to be done. Y'all, I stand before, I told y'all this at the pastoral anniversary last year, I think. There were times when my pastors had to pull me in the office and rebuke me because I was messing up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they did it to protect me because I really believed that they knew and God knew exactly what I would be doing right now. So if I would have had the wrong attitude when I got rebuked and chastised for whatever it is, I said or whatever it is I did then I would not have grown up and I would not be and God would not be able to use me in the position where I am right now so when you wrong you wrong pastor got to correct you sisters if you wrong about something and first lady got to correct you it's not about you it's not about her but it's about the kingdom of God there are going to be some Sundays brothers I'm going to tell you all right you shouldn't be that close to that sister 
Uh, brother, you shouldn't be in the office alone with somebody. Sisters, she lady might tell you, you can't be coming to church with that short dress on or them tight pants on. You can't be coming to church with all this hanging and all this the house of God. You can't do that. Don't get mad. We're doing it because we love you. We care about you. And our greatest responsibility is to the kingdom of God. So we got to get our egos out of the way. We can't be egotistical and still try to establish the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? amen? So not only should the pastor preach the word and be instant in and out of season and convince and rebuke, but watch this. A pastor also has to exhort. Yeah. Somebody say exhort. That comes from the Greek word parakleo. Amen. Amen. Now this means to beseech, to encourage, to comfort, and to help. It's not enough to reprove and rebuke people, but yet you have to encourage, comfort, help them, and carry the person to Christ. So it's not good enough for me just to rebuke and let you go on about your business. But after the rebuke, I'm supposed to encourage you. I'm supposed to embrace you. I'm supposed to let you know I still love you. I still, we still care about you. You mean a lot to this ministry, but we just got to get some things in order. Yeah, yeah. I don't know about you, but every time, even at home, when you, you notice when you discipline your children, when you have to whoop them, you got to go back and love them. You know, let them cry for a little while. Let them <laughs> let, 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 let them have a little moment. But then you got to go back and you got to embrace them. You got to go back and hug them, letting them, hey, mom and daddy still love you. You were wrong, but we still love you. My dad, I tell my children all the time, there is nothing you can do to make us stop loving you. Yeah. Nothing you can do. And I heard Bishop Jake say one time, he tell his daughters all the time, you can always come back home. Amen. My daughters know they will always, as long as I'm alive and my wife is alive, either one of us, they always have a home to go to. You ain't got to put up with no foolishness from no Negro. You got somewhere you can go. Amen. Amen. You got somewhere to go. Because a pastor, you have to, to encourage the people. Amen. A, per, and a, pastor, uh, you know, a pastor must exhort with all long suffering, no matter the circumstance. The, which, what does that mean? He must suffer a long time with people. Amen. The pastor has to also exhort with all doctrine and be balanced. In his approach to teaching and preaching the word of God. So that means that in the midst of all of these five things that Paul tells Timothy to do, there must be a balance. Notice I didn't talk a whole lot about just rebuke, 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 and then exhort, 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 exhort. It has to be a balance. And the many churches that we see, a lot of churches are filling up because there's not a balance in the preaching and the teaching is going forth Come on now. a lot of churches people will flock to churches if I know you gonna tell me how good I am and how much God loves me and how you can never do anything to make God stop loving you and you never address my sin of course I'm gonna keep coming to church Woo, praise the Lord I love that church some church you go to be everybody just look happy all the time like who everybody just smile I am a friend of God yes I am a friend of God I am a friend of God, He calls me, friend. but mess around and preach against their sin. Yeah. Then they be everybody, they be running out. You know, let me tell you, Pastor. Let me tell you, my, my pastor told us, and we were in a meeting with my pastor the other day. <laughs> we were in a meeting with my uh, with my pastor the other day. He said, "Could you imagine if you go there? There's a large mega church in the city. I dare I mention the name of it because this is being recorded. But could you imagine if a true prophet of God?" Walked in that church and really said what thus said the Lord. Do you think it still be as packed in as it is right now? Yeah. I'm gonna let that sink in for a little while. It's just like when you like when you turn the light on, it's a bunch of cockroaches. They just all scatter. <laughs> they gone. Or oh, the true prophet come. You uh, oh. <laughs> what you say, Brian Carr coming? Oh no, I ain't coming. <laughs> no. Oh, no, 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 no. So it, I can't preach a whole bunch of feel good messages. Pastor can't preach. He can't preach you happy every Sunday. We'll have our Sundays. Yeah, we're going to get happy. We're going to shout. We're going to dance. We're going to run around the church a little time. We're going to fall out on the floor. Yeah, we're going to have a few of those Sundays. But I can't do it every Sunday. Because I have to give you a balanced approach to the Word of God. Balance. 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 
So that is my responsibility. That's the pastor's responsibility to the people. Again, we're talking about having effective pulpit and parishioner relationship. Amen. Pastor and parishioner, pulpit and pew relationship. Now watch this because there's a responsibility that the people have. This is the purpose of the people. If you look back at Galatians chapter 6. As a matter of fact, in case y'all forgot it, let's go back and read it. Amen. Galatians chapter 6. And I'm not going to be before y'all long. If y'all give me about 10, 12 more minutes, I'll be done. I promise. Amen. Listen. Galatians in Galatians 6, it says, and I'm reading from, um, you know, I think I want to read that from New King James. Is it all right with y'all? Right. Right. Amen. We're gonna, let's read from the New King James. Galatians chapter 6. All right, Galatians. Here we go. And I want to read this. Verses 6 through 8. These three verses. Listen. It says, let him who was taught the word of, the, I'm sorry, let him who was taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now, watch this. Because, because we got to remember, because listen, listen, the responsibility of the people. Now, the relationship of the pastor and the people is a subject that's never really stressed a lot in church. Don't talk about it a lot. You know, this passage deals with the subject in particular with the students or the people, um, re their responsibility to the teacher, which is the pastor. Keep in mind that every believer that sits at the feet of God's teacher is a student. Yeah. A student of the pastor. The pastor serves as God's mouthpiece. So if I am God's mouthpiece, then you all are the students. You all are the pupils who God holds me responsible for teaching. Now, how does a believer do good by the pastor or the teacher? Watch this. By communicating and sharing in the ministry of the teacher. The teacher of the word shares spiritual treasures and those who are taught ought to share material treasures. We must remember that what we do with material things is evident of how we value spiritual things. What I do with my money, what I do with my materials is how much I value, um, how much I value spiritual things. Watch this because in Matthew chapter 6 verse 21 it says wherever your treasury is there the desires of your heart will also be so Paul repeatedly talked about he taught rather that the spiritual leader of the church was to be supported by the financial gifts of the people so Jesus said the laborer is worthy of his hire you see that in Luke 10 and 7 and Paul echoes the same statement in 1 Corinthians 9 and 11 and also 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18 but what I want y'all to realize is this there is a spiritual principle behind this You're right. again pastor ain't just trying to get stuff out of you okay but I'm just telling you what the word of God says as far as your responsibility as a parishioner because we got to be mindful that God does not command believers to give to the pastor just so his material needs can be met but that the giver may get a greater blessing yeah. Yeah. can I say that again it's so the giver may get a greater blessing we just read it in verse 7 it said what go back look at uh, Galatians 6 and 7 it says do not be deceived God is not mocked for whatever a man sows that will he also reap watch this so for he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap what corruption but he who sows to the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life so there is a principle behind this again this is not so much so the pastor can go around and go buy him a new Lexus come on, come on. this is not so the pastor can buy him a uh, 1.5 million dollar home this is not so the pastor can go out and buy his wife a bunch of Gucci, Nucci, Lucci and every other Hoochie that's out there that's not what this is about but this is about God being able to give you a blessing because you were obedient to his word and you sold into the teacher you're right, you're right. can you say amen today amen, amen. and then this is the basic principle of sowing and reaping is found throughout the entire Bible God has ordained that we reap what we sow. 
if it were not for this law uh, the whole principle of cause and effect would fail the farmer who sows wheat can expect to reap wheat and he always reaps more than he sows do y'all ever notice? I don't know if anybody has done any farming. Uh, farm. Anybody done any farming, anything like that? When you sow, Pastor, thank you. Anybody else did farming? So when you sow the seed, always remember, you will always reap more than what you sow. Can you say amen? So, but that goes on the flip side, because if you always sow a mess, yeah. <laughs> it's going to come back on you, and it's going to come back on you even worse than it did when you put it out there. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. And you can go back and read 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 16, and also 2 Kings uh, uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 37, and you can see examples of sowing into the man and woman of God. And it's so important that we understand that. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you so much for coming, man. We'll see you later. God bless you. So you got to remember, church, that you must be obedient to God's word in order to get the blessings that he has for you. And that's why we don't mind sowing into our bishop and our pastor because they sowed the word of God into our lives. That's why we don't mind going back and sowing into our childhood pastor because I know God used him and his ministry to introduce me to Christ. So that's a great thing. That's an awesome thing. That's a marvelous thing. And I've discovered that when I sowed into the man and woman of God, he always blessed me more abundantly than what I put out there. Can y'all say amen in here today? Amen. Now let me close by saying this because my purpose in sharing this message with you today is to help you to better understand this awesome relationship between the pastor and the parishioner. So again, don't take this message as an implication that we want something from you because we really don't. God, I tell y'all almost every week, God blesses me and my family. We are good. We are solid. We both have jobs. We got medical insurance. We got two cars in the driveway. Our, 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 we're healthy. Our children are healthy. We're, we're eating real good. As y'all can tell, I ain't missing no meals. So God is blessing. Okay, so don't get me wrong. Amen. But what I do want to show you is uh, the important task that we all have as it relates to this matter of the pulpit in the pew relationship and we also uh, want to show you that God can and will bless you can you say amen today amen now I can't make you do what God says I, I can't make anybody y'all are grown you live in your own house you pay your own bills pastor and lady D cannot make you do anything and if you really want to know the truth about it God can't even make you do it and he's not going to make you do it but what I can do is I can teach you what the Word of God says and but like the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus I commend you unto God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And now let me, I'm, I'm going to close for real by saying this, because I want y'all to know something. Now, again, I know this was a different kind of message. <laughs> And I pray that you all received it in the spirit that it was given. Amen. And I pray that y'all didn't get offended. That, my, that was not my purpose. Again, my purpose is just, first of all, to tell you what my responsibility as a pastor is and what your responsibility as the, as the people are. But that, that was the only, that was my goal right there. And, and, and again, I'm trying, I want you all to be blessed, amen, because of your obedience to God. But let me say this, because I really, y'all want to know what brings me my greatest joy? Let me tell y'all, as a pastor, you know, I haven't been doing this long, I've only been doing it three years, but I'm going to tell you what brings me my greatest joy. My greatest joy does not come on the fourth Sunday in September. Amen. Well, let me say our greatest joy, because my wife and I, we, we pastor together. Our joy does not come on the fourth Sunday in September. That's not when our joy comes, when we can dress up and sit in these nice chairs and, 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 and just in, and let the people of God bless us and let our home church come over and bless us. That's not where our greatest joy comes from. My greatest joy doesn't even come if somebody walks up to me and say, Pastor, you know, God just laid on my heart to just put this in your pocket and bless you. Because I've had people do that to me as well. I tried to get a blessing back. They didn't want They said, Pastor, I want to get blessed. I want to bless you. That's not where my greatest joy comes. You know where my greatest joy comes from? Seeing that when 